please turn your cell phones down? It's uh, sometimes even confusing either for the music or for the, uh, the word. When you're trying to do the word. Amen. Put, put it on uh, silent, vibrate, or whatever you need to do. If you could, please. But we're going to start uh, our service this morning. It's, a, it's another Sunday. Yes, it is. Another Sunday. It's really not any different than any other day is supposed to be. The only difference is it's the day that we come together in unison to praise our Lord. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. Thank you. 
The roommate moved out.
looking at anything you've done or said. Anything you said or done, that's not what he cares about. He cares about moving forward in a relationship with you. Amen? And you don't have to clean yourself up to get to him. He's going to do all the cleaning. We just have to show up. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, look how far you've come. You think you've gotten here on your own? He's been with you. That's right. You've got angels that have been protecting you from seen and unseen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Calamity. Lord. Seen and unseen calamity. We have managed yes. to escape because our God is keeping us. Hallelujah. Someone said, I heard a sermon recently about when the rapture occurs and the Holy Spirit is lifted from this place, yes. from this earth. You think I'm someone else, you know how people go, go mad, they, they start looting as soon as they get a reason in the news to go looting? When the spirit is lifted from this place, what little limits we do have on the earth of people doing what's right, evil people doing what's right, when they do do right, all of that will be lifted. Yeah. All, of all of that, the church is preserving the earth right now. Lord. And God is making a way out of no way. Yes, he yes. is the way maker. He's the healer, he's the keeper, he's the generator of all that is good. Amen? Hallelujah. And we thank him for being God. I teach science at um, Marine Baptist Academy for the fifth and sixth graders. And the question of their test was, what great thing has God done for us in the location of the earth in relation to the sun? And they had to say that he made it just right. If we were a little bit closer, we'd be frying. Maybe further back, we'd be frozen. But it's at the just right position, the right place where we can thrive and live on this planet because of what he is doing in the earth. Amen. What he's doing for us. He didn't deserve us. Stop blaming Adam and Eve. God is not deserving you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. you 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right? Praise God. 
Because they're singing for the Lord with all their hearts and souls, right? Yeah. It's just so beautiful. If you need counseling or financial budgeting advice, uh, see Pastor Kathleen right there. She's here on Thursdays from 12 to 4. Uh, come if you want to. If you want a prayer, if you want any kind of counseling, or just to come and fellowship with us. We are here from 12 to 4. We give out boxes of food for the families that need it. So if you if you know a family that needs food, please come and see me here on Thursdays from 12 to 4. Okay? And uh, Brother Caesar is here for, uh, to help us on Thursdays too, and then the Kathleen is here to pray with you. So, and uh, Sister Barbara is here. We all are here to help you and pray with you and encourage you. Amen. You know? So just come and join us here on Thursdays. Uh, continue to uh, pray for this city, for this county, for this country, for our leaders. Continue to pray for this ministry. At Bread of Life, at 431 Global Ministry, we need prayers. Okay? And uh, the, the mission has a new vision. And we are just praying for God, God's guidance in it. So we just want, if you want to pray with us and intercede with us, because we are thinking of the new generation. As you know, we have the little ones just walk in. You know, they are our future. You know, and God uses these little ones. And, uh, What's going on with Hallelujah. Father, the time has come, Lord. And just as we offered ourselves as a living sacrifice, we pray to you our offering to you right now, God. Yes. that there may be need in your house, Lord. And I thank you today, Lord God, that every need is met today, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From the crown of your head to the soul of their feet. And God, we thank you, Lord God, that you are turning lives around. Yes. That you are healing, hallelujah, Lord God. Whatever the, the need is today, we thank you that today it is yes. yes. Hallelujah. That's your word to say. All the promises are yes and amen. amen. Hallelujah. So be it. Amen. And we thank you today, God. And we honor you for who you are. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You may bring up your offering at this time if you'd like to give. To the ministry of bread of life if you'd like to give to the ministry sorry of 431 global ministry for the work of the ministry this is one place that definitely does the work of the ministry i have been here for all night prayer with them and what i'm used to when it comes to all night prayer is that we are praying for 45 minutes and we might share for 15 minutes and we pray for 45 minutes and we share for 15 minutes but in this place the doors were literally open from 2 in the afternoon to 2 in the next day on a Sunday for the sake of the community. It wasn't for me. It wasn't about me. The doors were open all night long. And I watched a family walk through here with an infant, a toddler, two teenagers, and a husband and a wife, 10 o'clock at night, and they came in for a, a meal. And they were here to serve a meal. We had a meal available. Amen? There are missions that are being contributed to and made ready and made provision for because of what we give here at 431 Global Ministries. Amen? So thank you for your contribution to the work of the kingdom of God. Amen? In the earth. Amen? Uh, when I selected this song that I was about to do, I didn't realize it was going to stay with the theme. I was still the theme of Waymaker. <laughs> so I guess that's what the Lord is wanting to us to remember. And keep in mind that he's making a way for you. Amen. If you don't see it and feel it, he's making a way, amen? Amen.
You're asking God to show you something. And in everything that the music coordinators put together today, it's God's hand. I will make a way. Two songs was I'm going to make a way. I'm the way maker. Yeah. If I could part the Red Sea and help three million people get across a dry ocean, well, well, come on. Yes, sir. Then I can do just about anything you need me to do. Anything. The same power. That rose Jesus Christ from the dead is the power that He'll put in your situation. Yes. Yes, sir. Amen. Now that's not my message today. 
Lady Kyle a few moments ago said that we're, we've been seeking God. We, for months we've had a, uh, an idea that was just an idea. And we've been seeking God, trying to seek God. Is this a vision? You know, I, not every idea is a vision. But we've been seeking God. And things are being said and things are happening that makes you think God is like, uh, I'm here. And recently some things have happened and transpired that made us think, well, maybe God is trying to stir up. So we're seeking God for a vision here. We, we've, got, we, we've got this idea but with a vision, you've got to have pro-vision, right? And what we're seeking right now is something that is humanly not possible for 431 Global Ministries. What George Mueller did at the end of the 1800s was not humanly possible either. Is God in the mood? Have we put him in the mix? But you ask, how does God speak to you? When you're seeking him for something and then you come to church and you hear music that's speaking to you, is God speaking to you? And then the first song we sang goes right in hand in hand with my message today, which I did coordinate that with the music. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. For being in the mix of what we're doing right here. Yes. 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 If you have your bulletin, look to the back. Remember I said last week that for the next little bit, every time I get up here to preach, I'm going to be giving you a Christian glossary word. We're speaking, we're, I'm teaching you the language of Christianese. Okay? This word phrase for today, last week was evangelism. The word phrase for today is salvation. There might be a little bit more to that word than you think. Salvation. On the back of your bulletin is the scripture that this is going to be themed from. Isaiah 52, 7 to 10. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. We talked about what good news was last week, right? The gospel. Who proclaim peace, who, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaim salvation. Who say to Zion, your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. With their voices they shall sing together. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord breaks back Zion. Or I should say brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together. You waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has confronted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Father, we pray for the anointing of this word. Yes, we know much of this had to do with Jerusalem about the time of the Babylonian siege came upon it. But there's something in here for us. And we're praying, Father, that you would be blessed. That you'll bless everyone who hears it. Feed us, Lord. Feed your sheep. In Jesus' name. Amen. I read the true story of a teenager who was on the driveway one day playing basketball. He lost one of his contact lenses. He was frustrated. 
He searched, he searched, he searched, but he couldn't find it. Totally discouraged, he finally went into the house, told his mother that the lens was nowhere to be found. The mother didn't say much. She just went outside and in a few minutes came back with the lens in her hand. The boy was shocked. Mom, I really looked hard for that. How did you manage to find it? She replied, we weren't looking for the same thing. You were looking for a small piece of plastic. I was looking for $150. Well, <laughs> You see, the mother was looking for something she regarded extremely valuable. Right. And because it was valuable, she didn't give up till she found it. Right. Hear me out. Jesus came looking for something really valuable. Scripture says that he came to seek and save the lost. In fact, Jesus' very name means Savior. When the angel appeared to Joseph, he told Joseph in Matthew 121 that his wife Mary will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means Savior. And that's the whole theme of the New Testament. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. The New Testament is all about salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now this sermon series, I said, is, 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 is really called uh, from the Christian glossary book is what you could call it. We're learning the language of Christianese. We're, 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 we're going over terms that are common but may not be fully understood. In our text in Isaiah, we find that salvation is extremely important to God. When someone is saved, it's time of excitement, joy for God. Notice what it said. We read it in verses 7 to 9. The feet of him who brings good news are beautiful, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things. Who proclaim salvation. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices. Listen to this. With their voices they shall sing together. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord brings back Zion. Bring forth into joy. Sing together. Lord. Now this is good news. These are good tidings. The watchmen of the city. Shout for joy it says. Our salvation. I'm trying to say here. Is a big deal to God. But now, what are we being saved from? Well, you know, when I prepare my sermons, I ask questions like that. And spitball for a, a while, throwing all kinds of thoughts in the mix, trying to find the best answers I can think of. And I could think of all kinds of things that God saves us from. That He saved me from. But I got to think, I wonder what does the Bible say? Now that's a good idea, don't you think? I mean, I'm a preacher, and this is about God's ideas rather than mine, right? Amen. So what does the Bible say that we're saved from? Let's hear again the words of the angel that he said regarding Mary. Matthew 1, 21. Bring forth the Son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. John 1, 29. We're told that John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him. He said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away what? The sins of the world. Now that's what we're saved from. We're saved from our sins. Paul tells us that before we became Christian, notice what he said. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. In which you once walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, 
just as the others. And what this is saying is this. Anyone who is not a Christian is an object of wrath. Before we became Christians, our destination was H-E-W-A. Romans 3.23 drives this home when he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. death. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe it? How many of you believe that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? How many of you believe that anyone outside of Christ is going to go to hell? Of course we do. It's in the Bible. We don't just make this stuff up. But when it comes to this issue, I have a problem. Because I'm going to be honest with you. I struggle with the idea that all these good people around me are sinners. I suffer from a spiritual disease called polyanaism. It's actually a psychological term, believe it or not. Polyanaism. The word came from a Disney movie about a little girl named Pollyanna. I think Haley Mills played the character. And the story revolved around her optimism and her belief in the goodness of people. They actually made a, a psychological word of that. I suffer sometimes from Pollyannaism. I tend to believe in the goodness of people. I tend not to see them all as being sinners. There's something inside of me that struggles with the idea that people outside Christ are going to hell. And a lot of people struggle with that. I'm not the only one. You see, the problem is this. We live around folks who seem so nice. Our perception of them is that they don't do anything wrong. When I was a kid, I told my grandfather. I looked up to my grandfather. He was the closest thing to Jesus to me. And I told him one day, I said, you don't do anything wrong. He looked at me with those big blue eyes and dark hair. And he said, do you believe I don't do anything wrong? Of course not. I do things wrong all the time. And you know what? That rocked my world. That shocked me. I couldn't believe it. But it's true. When it comes to how we see others, we often don't perceive those around us as doing anything wrong in their lives. Of course, the problem is that the Bible says they do. Folks do things and say things and think things that are wrong. They've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, just like you and me. Now, why do I perceive folks as being sinless, or at least kind of okay? Well, part of the reason is that folks are not going to air their dirty laundry in front of us. What if I were to tell everybody that's sitting in here today to come forward right now, and we're all going to go right down the line, and each of us is going to tell what a major sin is in our lives? What would you do? Get up and leave? <clears throat> there, look, look, there goes the cowboy. <laughs> How many would be uncomfortable with that suggestion? Let's be honest. I, I admire your, your gut. I do. I'm not going to do that. I was just because I'm There you go. Amen. Why would most of us want to share our sins? Unlike Cowboy here, who is all sold out for Jesus. Because we don't like the idea of others knowing about our sins. We don't want people knowing what our weakness is. What we struggle with. But outside of the purely pagan folks who enjoy doing and talking about all kinds of bad stuff. There are people out there that actually like that mess. Nice folks aren't going to tell you what they've done. Over the years I've learned that most folks are just like you and me. Have you ever stood in the shower and suddenly remembered something you had been ashamed of? Something you might have did bad or said something 20, 30 years ago. You get this sick feeling in your stomach. I still can't believe I said that or did that or thought that. A wave of shame and self-hatred swept over you like a flood. 
Have you ever had that happen to you? Of course you have. We all have. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote this. All of us have thoughts that would shame hell. We would actually shame hell. But now here's the problem. If you and I don't believe that, that other people suffer from guilt and state of self-hatred, then we're not going to tell people about Jesus. I mean, why should we? I mean, if someone is okay just the way they are, Jesus really didn't die for them. They're, they're, they're fine just the way they are. Because they don't need Jesus to save them from their sins. They're okay the, the, the way that they are. And if they're okay just the way they are, they don't need to hear about Jesus. They don't need to tell them, I'm not going to tell them because there's no sense embarrassing myself telling them something that they don't need to hear. Because I think they will make it into heaven all on their own. They're okay the way they are. Now do you see a problem with my logic that I'm giving you right now? The problem lies with Pollyannism. It's my belief in the goodness of folks. And the heart of the problem lies in the fact that I don't see people the way that God is seeing them. Back in the book of 1 Samuel, the prophet Samuel is commissioned by God to anoint the next king of Israel. He sees one man and believes that this man should be anointed. But God said, no, that's not the one. And Samuel saw the man's brother and thought, this man ought to be the king. But God again said, no, that's not the one. Finally, notice what God said in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. God told Samuel, do not look at his appearance or in his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, I see people only on the outside. But God sees your heart. He sees my heart. And because I can't see their hearts, I'm tempted to see, to see people as okay and, and to doubt that they might be going to hell. And if that happens, I won't sense the urgency of telling them what I know about Christ. And so, they may very well go to hell because I didn't want to embarrass myself by telling them my faith. But here's the good news. You remember last week's message I made the point. I don't have to convince people of their sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Jesus told us that the Spirit's job in John 16 and 8 is to convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. I don't have to convict people. That's His job. The Spirit is the one who will make people feel their guilt and shame so that they will want Jesus. But once the Spirit has done His part, once He makes folks so that they want Jesus, God wants me and you to be prepared to tell those folks about how to get what Jesus is offering. Did you catch the part in Isaiah 52 that we read? He said, how beautiful, Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news. Who proclaim peace. Who bring glad tidings of good things. Who proclaim salvation. That was such an important statement in the Bible. Guess what? God decided to repeat it in the New Testament. He did it through the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 10. Verses 14 to 15. Notice what was said here. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Who bring glad tidings of good things. Isaiah 52 is all about God saving mankind through Jesus Christ. And the chapter is filled with excitement and joy.
joy in the prospect of people coming to Christ. But God takes the time to praise you and me if we care enough to bring the good news to the lost. He even says that our feet are beautiful if you share him with others. So the question is, do you care enough? If someone were to come to you and say, what do I have to do to be saved? What would you tell them? Or would you say, Pastor, your feet are more beautiful than mine. You tell them. Here's the deal. The person that came to you and asked you, they didn't ask me, they asked you. They didn't ask me. If you really love Jesus so much, if somebody asks you a question like that, you're ready to share something. Your passion and how you feel toward Jesus is going to impress them. They may not talk to me, but right now they're sitting there talking to you. So what would you tell the people if they ask, what must I do to be saved? Well, there are a couple of times in the Bible where somebody actually asked that question. In Acts chapter 2, for example, Peter preached to the Jews and he told them that they had crucified Jesus. Peter's sermon was so powerful. Notice what was said happened. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Remember what Peter's answer was? Look at the next verse, Acts 2.38. Peter replied, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now that seems simple enough, doesn't it? What must we do to be forgiven by God? Repent. And it said be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You can't beat that for simplicity, can you? Can you remember that? Repent, be baptized. But now later on, in Acts, we find Paul and Silas were in prison. It was about midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. It says here in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. Everyone's chains were loosed. Verse 27. The keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Verse 29. Acts chapter 16. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Now, did, did, did Paul say, repent and be baptized? No. What did he say? Verse 31. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not what Peter said at Pentecost. Why did Peter say repent and be baptized? But yet here Paul is saying just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's kind of odd, isn't it? Not the same thing. Why, why should there be a difference? Would you like to know the answer? Because the crowd at Pentecost already believed in Jesus. One scholar noted that the Jews at Pentecost were knowledgeable about God, sin, atonement, the coming Messiah, and His coming kingdom. In fact, the Jews gathered on Pentecost were probably far more knowledgeable about the God of the Bible than most mature Christians are today. But the Philippian jailer didn't know any of that. He didn't know anything about Jesus or the God of the Bible. Paul had to start with the basics. Because if this man didn't know Jesus, there was no sense in going any further. Without Jesus, this man could repent and get wet all day long and it wouldn't have made any difference. 
Notice what we're told next. Acts chapter 16 verse 32. It says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. Listen to this. The children didn't get saved because of osmosis. He spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. So did Paul and Silas baptize this man and his family? Yes. But not until after they had spoken the word of the Lord to him and the rest of his household. Then they were baptized. Now how soon after these folks were taught were they baptized? Immediately. It was sometime after midnight. Notice they didn't wait till Sunday. They didn't call the church together to witness it. They didn't wait until more of a family could be there. They did it immediately. Why? Because there was a sense of urgency. This was salvation. This was a matter of eternal life or eternal damnation. Now just to help you, I, I put a little uh, something on the front of your book. Now, this is an interesting, if you look on the front of your bulletin, this is kind of a graph that gives you an overview of all that takes place when a person is saved. It's a staircase with each part representing a different step in salvation. It begins with God's part. God sent His Son. Then the second step, the Son shed His blood. Number three, the Spirit revealed the Word. And then the graph at the rest of this focuses in on the sinner's part. You heard it. You believed it. You repented. You confessed. You were baptized. You remained faithful. Now, notice there's scriptures underneath each of these. And, and people will put stuff like this together. But I want to make a very important point. I want to be clear about it. Without God's heart, you and I could do nothing to be saved, even if you did everything in these steps. Without God's part, you and I could do nothing to be saved. We could do everything else on this graph and we would still be lost because it is by the grace of God that we have the chance of salvation. Now, it does talk here about man's part. I, I don't really like the fact that they put in here man's part. I prefer to call it man's response to God's provision. Each of these stairs on that part of the staircase leads to the next. Without hearing, you can't believe. Without believing, you can't repent. Without repentance, you cannot confess. And without all of the previous items, you cannot get baptized biblically. Now notice, I didn't say you couldn't get baptized. You could get baptized all day long. But you couldn't do it biblically. Baptism is not the end all of salvation. It's the culmination of everything else as to how we respond to God's gracious gift. Now I agree that each of these steps is a process in the act of salvation. But as I say, I wish to share with you that regardless of our response, it is Christ alone that makes it possible. Now, this idea, the people who put this little thing together, there are different denominations that <coughs> subscribe to this. They hand it out and they pass it out to people. But I'm going to say something. The, the original person who had this concept was a 19th century evangelist by the name of Walter Scott. Scott believed a little bit differently than how this is presented. He believed that Jesus, the Messiah, was the golden oracle of the Christian faith. Well, I, I don't think he's wrong on that statement, do you? Jesus was to be lifted up, and people were called to respond to him. Jesus, the Messiah, was the creed of Christianity. Faith in him was the requirement of entrance in the term of fellowship of Christianity. 
In a nutshell, he preached what he called an ancient gospel. And he arranged it into six items. Faith in God's Messiah, repentance toward God, baptism in Jesus' name, remission of sins, which was God's gift, gift of the Holy Spirit, God's gift, and eternal life, God's gift. For the rest of his life, Walter Scott preached that ancient gospel, and he averaged baptizing around a thousand people every year, which translated into over 30,000 folks confessing the Messiah in response to his preaching. Now, Scott cut through the confusion and the agony of many people who seek God who never receive assurance that he had been elected by God. Because Calvinism was real strong during that time period. And some people said, I just don't feel chosen. I don't feel like the elect. So I must be damned for hell. But when he put Jesus as the center front and said that everything that you're doing is the Jesus in you that's helping you do it. The repentance is because of the power of Christ in you that's breaking the sin out of you. When he started look, letting people look at it from that aspect, people started getting delivered like crazy and coming to Jesus. What Mr. Scott taught never lost sight that Christ is the object of our faith. He is the object of our adoration. He is the object of our love. And it was told what God had done and doing and will get to in the future. And we have responded in faith to that golden oracle. We repent of our sin to God. We in our faith are baptized in the name of Jesus. And as a result, God forgives. He remits our sin. He grants the gift of himself and the person of the Holy Spirit into our lives. With the assurance that we're saved. And then... If we ask for it, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then God seals us for eternity. But unfortunately, as I said, many took Scott's ancient gospel model and made it more of a legalistic endeavor on how to be saved. The simple answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? I agree with everything on here. I agree that everything on here is what happens. But is this a, a do all this to give you assurance? I know I'm saying because I did it take them in the States. No. The simple answer to the question, what must I do to be saved, is this. Respond to Christ's invitation and let Him transform you. Yeah. That's the simple answer. Now that's kind of simple too, isn't it? You don't have to be a Ph.D. or Bible college graduate to understand that. All you need to do is be ready when God sends someone your way. But when God does send someone your way, you need to realize the urgency of the task. And the value that God places on your faithfulness in this matter. There was a man named John Mays. He wrote... Something that happened in his life. He said, I was on my honeymoon in the Bahamas when a man walked up to me and he said, Would you like to buy some cocaine? You can tell everyone how much you really enjoyed the Bahamas if you buy what I got. After he said, I said no, and I got over the shock of that man's boldness, I wondered how Jesus would have responded if someone came up to him selling drugs. Later that day, someone else came up to me selling drugs, he said. And that, and that gave me another chance to share Jesus with them in the most creative way. After he told me what he had, he had the good stuff. I asked him, what have you got? He said, cocaine. I looked at that man, he said, and this is what I asked him. I said, is that all you have? I'm disappointed. I was hoping you would have something better than that. You see, I got the real thing. I got the real stuff. What I have is all natural, pure, and very powerful. And it makes me feel great all day and all night long. And get this. It may be illegal in some countries what I got. So you can't get arrested for having what I got. 
The man stopped smiling. He said, and he's still telling this story. I'm reading it. He stopped smiling. And he got this real serious look on his face. He said, I want what you have. How do I get it? Now this man was on the same move. Now, we didn't go to the Bahamas on our honeymoon. But I imagine here I am a preacher. I'm going on my honeymoon. And now somebody's asking me, what must I do to get saved? I hope he's got a good God-fearing woman who's going to be just as excited as him. But now he's going to start preaching. And he's supposed to be on his honeymoon. But notice what happened. In the very beginning of that day, he got shocked by what he he encountered. But after he got over the shockness, he realized, I could have used that as an opportunity to make a witness. And do you know God gave him another opportunity? And you know what happened to that man? He accepted Christ. That man accepted Christ because our brother had this creative way to throw back at him what that man was trying to offer him. You see, our brother was prepared to tell the man about Jesus. And he succeeded because he was committed to making sure that that man would have a chance of eternal life. I don't know if you realize it, brothers and sisters, but every single one of you has been commissioned by the Master to go and make disciples. It's not just a preacher thing. I'm here to encourage you, to incite you, and to give you what I can give you to help you in your commission. We all have the same commission. We're told, let your light shine. You've got a light in you. You better let it shine, Jesus said. You encounter people out there that I will never encounter. You're allowed to go places that I'm not allowed to go. And if you really love the people you're hanging out with and the people that you're around, if you really love them, you're going to be aware that there's a good chance they could be they could be going to hell. There's a good chance they may not be here tomorrow. We just had a, a overdose out here yesterday. If you love these people and your people, we all love them, but you have a special relationship with them. You got to come up with some create, creative ways to get them in here. With you. Some creative ways to witness to them. To help them wake up. Because the devil, sometimes I think the devil, when, he look, when he's looking back here behind us, he's probably sitting back with his head shaking, thinking, yeah, I got this, I'm good. And it's our condition snatched them out of that power. That's right, that's right. But we don't do it with fear. We talked about that last week. We do it because we love them. That's right. And if you really believe what everything that we that we read in the Bible, if you really, really believe it, I, I said made that point last week. He, the, the, an atheist said, if, if, if I really believe what you people say is true, I wouldn't stop preaching. Way back in John Booth's day, at the turn of the, of the century, between the, eight, the 19th century and the 20th century, there was a man who told John Booth, if I really believe what you're preaching, he said, I would go all over London on my knees over shattered glass to proclaim it, if I believe it. Because what you're, what you're saying is so out there and so strong, I would want my worst enemy to experience it. I would 
would go all over London on my knees and shatter glass to try to save me. And you know what? That's the same position we're in today. There are some good people out here that we love them. They come in here all the time. They get food. They, get, they come in here for services. Sometimes they just come in here to hang out. We love them. You love them. But do we really believe what we've been taught from you? If we really, really believe it, our feet are going to be the prettiest thing that can be looked at. Isaiah said, how beautiful are the feet of those who shed the good news. We're going to be out there sharing. And it's not bad news, it's good news. But we're not going to go out there and say, you're on your way to hell. We're going to go out there and say, you know what? Jesus loves you so much. He's just waiting for you to come out of it. He's already extended his hand to you. You just got to grab it and go with it. Let go. And it's not your works of you getting rid of the sin. It's him in you that's purging it out. And it's his righteousness that comes on you. And that is the grace of God. The amazing grace of God. The man who wrote that song, the lyrics of that song, was a slave trader. And you know, the man who wrote the music to it was a former slave. And the two of them got together and wrote one of the greatest songs in our hymnal. Amazing grace. Amen. It was the grace of God that would put a slave owner and a slave together to make one of the most profound Christian songs of our day. Amen. That's a, it, the, the, the song in itself is amazing grace. <laughs> and it's amazing grace to each and every one of us. That God has done what he has done. Amen. And that he's doing what he's doing. Salvation. That's what it's about. That's what we proclaim. How do you feel about it? Are you happy that you feel assured right now that you're saved? The pastor, I've got this little hang up and I just can't get over it. I believe everything you say. I believe it with all my heart. And I come here and I sing. And I might even put a couple dollars in the place. I, I believe everything. But I got this little hang up I can't let go of. I don't think Jesus loves me because of it. I don't think I can take it. You ever felt like that? Let me tell you something. If you have those feelings that because of what I'm doing or why I can't get over it, that there's no way Jesus is going to have me in his heaven, you need to rebuke, rebuke the devil's lie right now. Because that's the lie. That's the devil. There is no mountain too high. There's no valley too low. We can overcome and we do it by the blood of the Lamb. Don't let the devil's lies control your destiny. Because that's what it is. The, devil, the devil's trying to get you into a position where you feel so bad about yourself that you're not going to try anymore. Now he's really got you hooked. Don't listen to those lies. The heavens rejoice when a lost soul comes back to God. We're told to sing and, and, and celebrate when people accept the good news. Is there anybody here today that would like to accept the good news? 
You might say, well, no, I, I, I know the good news. I believe it. I believe in the gospel. Is there anybody here today that might have been struggling, like I said earlier, with thoughts, guilt, and shame? Don't be overconfident and think, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Yes, sir. I will be more than happy to pray Anybody that just simply needs prayer, we ask you to come
several times this thing happened. It was disabled. My broadcast cast was disabled. It was blocked. I don't understand that. So I kept getting had to get started. Ad ad breaks disabled. It had something to do with the music. <laughs> the video contains music, audio, or video that may belong to someone else. So someone. That's why they blocked it. 